Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And now I will turn the meeting over to Ms. Marisa Scalafoli. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you, Pat. Um, good afternoon, good morning to those of you on the West Coast and in Alaska and Hawaii. My name is Marisa Scalafoli. I work in the Office of Policy Analysis and Development at the Administration for Community Living, a new agency under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which brings together the Administration on Aging, the Administration on Developmental Disabilities, and the Office on Disability. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's webinar, our latest in a series of webinars focused on opportunities for the aging and disability networks, both state and local agencies, within the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as the Affordable Care Act or the ACA. Uh, this webinar di series is designed to provide, um, to provide the aging and disability networks with the tools that you need to participate in ACA re related efforts in your area, such as accountable care organizations, the community-based care transition program, um, health homes, and more um, going on. When many of us think of evaluation, we tend to think of large-scale, expensive, multi-year studies that look at whether or not programs made a difference. But an important part of the rapid cycle improvements occurring in healthcare and long-term supports and services as a result of the Affordable Care Act um, is being able to implement and test small changes within your organization to see if they lead to better outcomes and to quality improvement. Um, these short cycle, small scale tests, um, when coupled with analysis of the results of those tests, can be helpful because they allow you and your organization to learn from these tests before you implement programs more broadly. Um, one such method for testing change uh, is something called the Plan, Do, Study, Act, or PDSA cycle, uh, which is what we will be focusing on in today's webinar. Um, first, you'll hear an overview of PDSA cycles, and next, you will see how one community is putting PDSA cycles into action in its community-based care transition program. So before I introduce our, our wonderful panel of speakers, we have a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, first, if you have not yet done so, please use the link included in your email confirmation to get onto WebEx so that you can not only follow along with the slides as we go through them, but also ask your questions when you have them through the chat function within WebEx. If you don't have access to the link that we emailed you, you can also go to www.webex.com click on the Attend a Meeting button at the top of the page and enter the meeting number, which is 660-039-618. And the passcode is AOA Webinar, and that's all one word. Again, the meeting number is 660-039-618, and the passcode is AOA Webinar. Um, if you have any problems getting into WebEx, please do contact WebEx Technical Support at one 569 3239. Again, that technical support number at WebEx is 1-866-569-3239. Um, second, as Pat mentioned, all, all participants are in listen-only mode at this point. However, we do welcome your questions throughout the course of the webinar. There are two ways that you can ask your questions. One, as I mentioned before, is through the uh, through the web using the chat function within WebEx. You can enter your questions. We'll sort through them and answer them as best we can when we take breaks for questions um, after each presentation. And second, it, after uh, both sets of presenters wrap up, we will offer you a chance to ask your questions through the audio line. Um, when that time comes, Pat will give you instructions as to how to queue up to ask your questions. And as always, if you think of any questions after the webinar or have any questions you'd like us to follow up on, you can email them to us at affordablecareact at aoa.hhs.gov. Again, that's affordablecareact at aoa.hhs.gov. Um, finally, as Pat mentioned, we are recording this webinar. We will post the recording slides and a transcript of this webinar on the AOA website as soon as possible. Um, you can get to it by clicking on the Health Reform and the Aging Network button on our homepage, um, and we should have it posted hopefully by late next week. So with that, enough, enough of the housekeeping announcements. Um, I, I, we are thrilled to have with us today um, three terrific speakers. Um, our first speaker will be Jane Brock, who is the Chief Medical Officer with the Colorado Foundation for Medical Care. Uh, 
Um, our second speaker, actually we'll have a team of speakers um, giving the next presentation, um, and um, that team will be Stephen Tuzel, uh, Director of Long-Term Care at the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, and Stephen R. Carson, who is a Vice President at Temple University Hospital. Um, but first, let me introduce Jane, who will be presenting first. Um, as I mentioned, Jane Brock is the Chief Medical Officer for the Colorado Foundation for Medical Care, which is the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization, or QIO, um, for the state of Colorado. She is currently the medical director of the CMS QIO 10th Statement of Work, Integrating Care for Populations and Communities, or ICPC, uh, na the National Coordinating Center. The ICPC National Coordinating Center is providing leadership and support to 41 QIOs as they recruit communities of providers and uh, people with Medicare to work together to reduce unwanted hospital readmissions. She also serves as an expert faculty member um, for CMS's Community-Based Care Transitions Program Technical Assistance Contractor. Um, so with that, I will turn things over to Jane. And I'm getting your slides up right now, Jane. Thank you, Marisa. Um, and thank you, everybody, for uh, calling in. So I just want to review um, sort of the basic principles of, uh, they're really called Stewart Cycles. Um, so Stuart was a statistician that worked his entire career for Bell Labs. Um, so was uh, um, measuring and applying statistics to industrial processes. Um, we now mostly call this the PDSA, or I've even, uh, it's been verbed, we're going to PDSA that, that sort of thing, but it's really a Stuart cycle. So I just wanted to um, introduce people to it if you've not used these extensively and or review it uh, for those of you that, that feel like you have the basic knowledge but um, haven't been over it for a while. So next slide. So really, uh, this is just a method of uh, trying to change. So um, all improvement takes change, but not all change is improvement. So um, I think about it like this. If you're going to try to do something better, I think these are the, the three um, methods that people usually try. Uh, the first one is, uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. I think there is a perception, and it can be true, um, that trying to change is, is worse than just trying to adapt to uh, what you've got now. Um, there's clear advantages in not doing anything in that it's obviously effortless. Um, however, I think we all know, and any, anything having to do with healthcare today, there's just no basis uh, in reality for feeling like things aren't broken. Um, so the second method, which um, I know my training um, was largely based on, was um, sort of a traditional research method. And so the advantages of research is that it um, collects the kind of data that in the end gives you um, an answer that is what I call truly true. So, you know, you're going to take your, um, the target that you're trying to change, you're going to measure all these characteristics about the target, um, you're going to match that, those characteristics to a non-target population, you're going to introduce one chain feature into the targeted population, um, in the end you put it all into a big, uh, a big uh, model, you know, a logistic regression model, and at the end you get a p-value, so it's helpful because you can publish it, and in the end you can say, truly, for a population that is defined exactly like this, this change was good. Um, the disadvantages for this uh, is it's really not appropriate for measuring change for a number of reasons, both um, statistical and practical. Uh, but for the main thing is, in the end, you will know something about a very small slice of a very specifically defined population, and you may or may not be able to extrapolate those findings um, to any other situation. Um, in the practical sense, it also takes a very long time. You know, a real research study, you have to you know, have a run-in period, and you've got to randomize subjects and assign them here and there. Um, it's quite expensive because it takes a long time, and in the end, it's inflexible. To really prove the value of this intervention, you have to um, rigidly adhere to the model, even if, you know, one month into the protocol, you realize, oh my gosh, uh, the world has changed in the past month. And I think that's characteristic of um, healthcare improvement is if you take too long to frame your question, test it, analyze those results, and publish it, sometimes the question itself isn't even relevant at that point. Um, so now we get to trial and error. And, you know, trial and error, in my opinion, has had kind of a bad rap. Um, there are actually some advantages to trial and error. Um, so the most, the most important one, I think, is that it's often a spontaneous decision. You know, I just can't take it anymore. I'm just going to try doing this a different way today. Um, it's very flexible. Um, usually it's uh, the best trial and error tests are very small. It's me and what I have to do today, and I'm just going to try doing it differently. So, you know, I don't have to get a protocol. I don't have to talk to anybody about it. 
um, the expert who is affected by the process or the, the issue at hand is the one who decides to try this. Um, it's very quick, and since you didn't tell anybody about it and you didn't change any infrastructure, if it didn't go well, you can just abandon it the next day, you know, really nothing lost. Um, so the main disadvantage to trial and error is that um, if you don't measure it to some degree, um, you uh, sometimes had some things about your little trial that were good um, and some things that weren't. But if you don't separate that out, what you risk is, is either just abandoning trying to change altogether or sort of testing the same thing over and over again. Um, so that the main disadvantage of trial and error is that it wastes the opportunity to learn. So next slide. So PDSA, or the Schuert cycle, um, really is just a way to be systematic enough to capture knowledge from trial and error. Um, you want to keep it, the trials to be things that you could really just do today. Um, and the hope is that as you gain information from little spontaneous uh, tests, that um, your trials will get better over sequential tests because you captured some knowledge about what was good and what wasn't good so that your modifications are not things like a total rejection of trying to change versus embracing a whole different change, but you can modify change over time um, and get better um, sequential tests. So um, this is my story. This is how I became a believer in the model for improvement. So um, I uh, was trained uh, by IHI, um, and, you know, in conjunction with their um, quality improvement collaboratives. And my role, uh, when I, the very first time uh, I was involved in a collaborative, my role was to teach the model for improvement. And so I had sat through a number of sessions um, training on the model for improvement and PDSAs. And, and in the end, you know, there were a lot of circles and arrows, and they kind of, you know, went in one eye and out the other eye. And uh, on the eve of realizing I was going to have to teach this, um, I realized that I was perhaps not a total believer in the model for improvement myself, you know, having not uh, really tried it um, in a complicated setting like what we were asking providers to do. So. Um, so if you read about the model for improvement, it says you can use the model for improvement for any problem. You can apply this methodology to any problem in your life. Um, so at the time I realized I needed to really get some experience with this, uh, the number one problem in my life was um, getting my kids to school on time. So uh, my husband and I, we have uh, a lot of evidence that we can be effective at a number of things, but we could not be effective at getting our kindergartner and first grader to school on time. Um, so at the time, uh, the kids went to an elementary school that was uh, literally a block and a half from our house such that we could actually hear the bell ringing from our house from the kitchen where we were typically still eating breakfast <laughs> and or trying to find stuff. So um, our typical experience of trying to get the kids to school on time was, you know, a lot of shouting, wear your shoes, forget it, you don't need socks, you don't need that toy, whatever, um, and we would start sprinting. So um, it was an old-fashioned school. They actually had a bell that somebody rang, so it rang for quite a while. And occasionally we could actually sprint that block and a half to manage to get to the door before the bell started ringing, so we technically weren't late. Um, but really, over time, I started to think, look, why don't I just try to see if we can improve this um, using PDSA? So now, the first thing we did is collect baseline data. Um, and I want to encourage people to realize you don't have to have comprehensive baseline data. Uh, but but um, at the time, you know, I was just making my transition from um, research. So I felt like, oh, I'm going to capture baseline data. Um, of, or I'm going to get an N of 10. I want 10 data points. And so um, I didn't know first how to start because the problem was it was the most chaotic hour of the day. And so now I was thinking, oh, gosh, I have to collect data. How am I going to do that? So the way I solved this problem is I just got a stopwatch. And when I heard the bell ringing or when we got to school, I started the stopwatch and measured the interval between the second event. Either we were at school um, and I could just measure the time until the bell rang or the bell started ringing and we weren't at school. And <laughs> I could start then and measure when we did get to school. So, here is my baseline data. And as you can see, we had a, a pretty big problem. Uh, the, the two, the uh, observation six and seven, were when we arrived at the bell stopped ringing. So we technically weren't late, but I felt like I would like to eliminate that whole experience as well. So, so the baseline data that, that we started with is that we were late, um, or almost late, 60% um, of the time. Um, and uh, now I also wanted to put in a balancing measure. And I would encourage everybody who is trying this to put in balancing measures. And what I mean by balancing measures almost always is the acceptability to the team um, of changing things. So my concern was we could get to school occasionally on time, uh, but, but it was really leading to a lot of, well, a lot of shouting, um, you know, uh, uh, encouraging it 
sometimes with an angry tone of voice, <laughs> my kids to get it together. Um, so I wanted to measure as a balancing measure uh, what I called negative parental interventions. Now, keep in mind, I was the PI. I was the only one I had to ask permission to do this, and it was my assessment of whether or not there were negative parental interventions. Um, but at baseline, I thought we were later almost 60% of the time. And um, during that 10-item um, data collection uh, phase, uh, there were 21 negative parental interventions, or 2.1 per day. So this is where I started from. OK, next slide. So uh, my idea at the time, OK, given that I wasn't totally bought into the model for improvement just yet, um, was I thought, OK, we just need to get up earlier. I mean, everybody knows you need to get up earlier. And nobody really needs a model for improvement to know that. So um, I decided that we were going to, for 10 data points, we were going to get up 30 minutes earlier. So here's my uh, data from that whole phase. And you'll notice I stopped at 7. <laughs> so so uh, for 7 days, we got up 30 minutes earlier. And I have to tell you, that data point 7 was uh, the day that we came out of our house and the next door neighbors who went to the same school were stumbling out of their house at the same point. The bell was ringing. And Elena, their oldest child, said something like, can we sprint with you? <laughs> I said, yes, of course. Um, and like, her hair was all disheveled and all that. And, and uh, she said, oh my gosh, we overslept. We just got up about 10 minutes ago. OK, so we had been up for an hour and a half at this point. And Helena, who got up 10 minutes ago, was sprinting with us. And so I said, of course, I said, well, you probably didn't eat breakfast, did you? And she said, oh yeah, we ate breakfast. OK, so I stopped data collection at that point, realizing, you know, I think Getting up earlier is not our problem. So at this point, um, we were later almost 57% um, uh, of the time. So that was no improvement, in my opinion. And the negative parental, um, negative parental interventions were 17 or 1.7 per day. So there was slight improvement on that. But really, what probably happened is I just had more time, uh, you know, an hour and a half getting up early so that I didn't have to be as urgent with my negative parental intervention. All right, so I decided, OK, I'm going to give the model for improvement a full test. So we did what you're supposed to do. We wrote an aim statement. Here's our aim statement. Increase the proportion of time arriving at school on time by improving morning processes and workflow for all members of the family while reducing negative parental intervention. <laughs> OK, next slide. Uh, so um, um, how will we know changes and improvements? Um, it'll be number of times on time, obviously, and the number of negative parental interventions. So I just want to point out, this is the advantage of a balancing measure. So my husband, who is not a clinician, um, said, you know, I love that scene in The Sound of Music where uh, the father has the whistles, and he does the whistle, and the kids have to sound off. And so that was his idea. And I felt like, OK, we could probably get to school on time using those methods, but that's really not what I want. And so the model for improvement, really, is about making it acceptable to all members of the team, and we're just going to test this method. Um, so the one thing that I did do is I bought the book, The Improvement Guide. And I don't know if folks here are familiar with it and or they use it, but it's by Langley and Nolan. Um, and it's quite a large book. It's several hundred pages. But the thing that's the most valuable about this book is um, in the back, there's probably 30 pages of um, actual concepts to test change in. It's just a list of change concept ideas. And so I actually went to this uh, book and looked in the appendix to think about what, what changes could we test. So next slide. Um, at the time we started, here were my theories. And, and see, they're not well-formed theories, but th this is really where you start, just with your, your basic ideas, um, you as the sort of process owner. OK, I thought we just were basically disorganized. We had no routine and no expectations. I felt that we probably had bottlenecks. I suspected that people were spending a lot of time in the bathroom. You know, all they had to do was brush their teeth. But anyway, there seemed to be a big gap of time in there. Um, and then there was clearly a lot of wasteful activity at the very end where everybody was running around trying to find things. Um, so I then mapped our current state. So next slide. Um, and so this just describes kind of the routine um, of how it went. So people would get up. There would be this sort of transition period. They'd spend a certain amount of time in the bathroom. Uh, there would be a transition period where they were getting dressed. Uh, and keep in mind, this is only two small children. Uh, but it was really kind of a difficult process to measure. Um, then we would eat breakfast. Then they would go back upstairs to brush their hair and brush their teeth. Uh, and then we would get all our stuff together. And this was a very problematic interval. And then we would walk and or sprint, depending on whether the bell was ringing, um, to get to school. And then we would arrive at school. So when I started thinking about what changes can we make, um, I found this in the improvement guide. First of all, you could smooth the workflow, so change the order of activities. Um, I wanted to eliminate the waste of movement, all this running around at the end. Um, and I wanted to emphasize natural and logical consequences. And I realized this is a concept that is, I think, the title of a parenting book. 
Uh, but it's actually an improvement um, strategy um, in the improvement guide. So I decided what we would do is eat breakfast last as the back door through which we exit to get to school is in the kitchen. Um, and we'll measure the before breakfast interval. Now, this was just a decision made by the PI on the fly. I'm thinking that it's really this before, if we're going to eat breakfast last, I don't think breakfast is the interval in and of itself that's driving us crazy. Um, I want to measure the time to getting to breakfast. Okay, so next slide. So um, the proposed future state then would look like this. I think I explained that. So next slide. So here's my data. Now, I did collect nine data points on this. Um, so I was uh, following them around. <laughs> That's much, um, but mostly measuring the interval between getting up and arriving at breakfast, and then the interval between the bell and um, um, uh, arriving at school. And here's what I found. And so here's my my hunch was right that it was this whole before breakfast thing. Breakfast is not the problem. Um, it's the before breakfast interval that's obviously out of control. Moreover, it directly correlates with um, our being late or not being late. So at the end of this uh, PDSA cycle, I felt that we were late. I mean, we well. We were late about 40% of the time, and I accepted this as improvements. Now, I hope I'm making the point here. This is not this is hardly scientific. Nobody's going to get a p-value out of this. But we went from 60% um, to 40%. And the negative parental intervention seemed better, although I wasn't really happy with this. And I suspected, really, that the negative parental interventions were just slightly more effective, because now they could be something like, well, you know, you won't get to eat breakfast, because we're going to leave for school anyway. Um, so next. Uh, next slide. So if I had to summarize this as a PDSA cycle, here it was. Test number one, smooth workflow, eliminate waste, uh, this whole moving up and down uh, to brush teeth and that sort of thing, um, emphasize natural and logical consequences. Uh, what I did was make breakfast last and measure the time until breakfast. Uh, what we studied was the time until breakfast um, as it relates to the outcome. And my action was I thought this was good. There was enough improvement. Um, it's clearly insufficient. And I felt like, you know, I might need to measure um, other types of intervals. All right, so uh, next next slide. So I thought, all right, what am I going to do for my next uh, my next uh, test? So um, there is in the improvement guide one of the change concepts where you set up startup time by doing external work ahead of time. So what this meant to me is, you know, this whole getting dressed interval seems to be very chaotic. Uh, why don't we lay out clothes the night before to reduce the workload of the morning? And I wanted to keep the before breakfast interval measurements. So next slide. So here was my data. Um, all right, this is doing activities the night before. We were going to unload the morning. Um, and as you can see, we really uh, had no improvement here. Later, almost 50% of the time, uh, negative parental interventions were slightly better. What I really probably did was transfer those parental interventions to the night before. You know, you have to get your stuff ready now. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I gauged that as slight improvement. This is the advantage, I think, to PDSAs. Um, they're small. You, as the PI, get to decide whether you think it was improvement to a certain extent. Um, so next slide. Uh, this is the way I summarize this test, reducing the setup and startup time by doing some things uh, ahead, um, specifically setting out clothes, collecting the stuff to go. Um, it was really not better. I thought this was insufficient improvement. And honestly, I was really surprised at this. So this is when I really started to believe, I think, in the model for improvement. Um, so I felt that we should probably keep this. Um, but uh, this is the first time it occurred to me that maybe time is not our issue. Now, you would have thought that I could have had a hint that this would be the case, because getting up 30 minutes earlier didn't make any difference. However, you know, I, I think my, um, my preconceived notions about what the problem was was sort of driving my uh, test of change. And this is, again, a huge advantage to the model for improvement. I didn't have to accept or reject in total. Um, it was really a chance to test further potential iterations of what is the what is the issue of this time management in this and, and what are the other issues. So next slide. All right, so for the third test of change, uh, what changes can we make? I went back to the improvement guide and there is an item, reduce demotivating aspects of the pay system by providing incentives. So we started a points earning program where if they were on time for breakfast, they would get points and these would accumulate towards the opportunity for ice cream because ice cream is the favorite food of the principal investigator of this study. Um, so uh, I, got, I did engage them. We were going to collect marbles in a dish. And when there were enough marbles, we would go and get some special treats. So uh, next slide. Um, and so here's what happened. Um, as we uh, were providing incentives, the before breakfast interval finally showed what I would describe as significant improvement. Uh, we were later almost 20% of the time, and the negative parental interventions were much down, sort of like, well, don't you want ice cream? 
Um, and so I felt this was a real step in the right direction. Um, however, I wasn't going to accept 20%. So 20% failure rates is really still way too much. So I decided to do another test. So for my next test, I went back to the improvement guide. Um, and there is a, um, um, uh, an item that's potentially problematic because it's so big of find bottlenecks now. Um, I had to admit, there's this, this black hole at the time that I wasn't finding. Um, I, it was clear that, that incentives were the problem and not time at this point, um, but I still didn't know exactly where the waste was, was coming. So 20% of the time, with kids who are getting everything ready ahead of time, right, eating breakfast last, earning points towards ice cream, um, but we still weren't really, it didn't feel as, um, I hadn't managed the chaos as much as I wanted to. So I finally decided I would capture measures of specific intervals. Um, so we at the time um, were in a, living in a house that had one bathroom, and I was thinking, oh gosh, everybody knows you need more than one bathroom. What I'm going to find is that we're had a, we have a slow problem through the bathroom. Um, next slide. Um, so. Um, I just want to point this out. This is not what I would describe as the ideal data collection strategy, but, but I was collecting this data during the most um, chaotic interval of the day, that hour between getting up and getting to school. Um, so I just captured snapshots of activity as I was able to do. So this actually did not take 10 times. This took more like 20, 25 times where I could just capture a snippet of this or that you know, kid doing some activity. Um, and I put them all into the same, uh, you know, sort of just one chart type uh, method. And as you can see, well, maybe you can't see, but it's the pink line that really correlates with um, getting to school on time. And it was just getting dressed interval. Um, now, we were still, I, I really hadn't improved too much over the last cycle. We were still at 20% later almost. The negative parental interventions were roughly the same. But this was a really informative test to me because, if you'll recall, these were kids who were putting their clothes out at night, and yet the get dressed interval was first of all quite variable, and secondly directly correlated with our outcome measure. Um, next slide. So in the end, um, I realized that it's this getting dressed interval that is the source of our problem. Um, it is not actually a bottleneck in the bathroom, so thank goodness I didn't look at this problem from the beginning and decide to get up two hours early and uh, spend sixty thousand dollars on uh, you know putting a big addition on our house to get another bathroom. Um, next slide. Um, what was happening is that the kids were, <laughs> for those of you who have children, I suspect this is a common problem, um, that the kids were, had laid out their clothes but would make a decision in the morning after they got up uh, to go find their favorite whatever, and it was typically in the laundry. <laughs> Sometimes it was wet in the um, washing machine. It didn't really matter to them. Uh, they were dead set on uh, getting certain types of things to wear. Um, so what we did then is incentivize wearing the prearranged clothing specifically, and that was what they had to do uh, to um, earn points for ice cream. So um, next slide. I don't know if I put the final slide in here. Um, so we went to perfect after that. Uh, we were on time, absolutely on time, um, every day for like two months without missing. Um, so in terms of summarizing what I learned from doing this series of, of things, so getting up earlier was no change. Now, I should have reflected on that just a little bit more. How can 30 minutes not help? Uh, rearranging the order of activities did improve. Now, removing activities was no change. And this is a wasted test in retrospect. I could have predicted this based on the fact that 30 minutes was not our problem. Um, providing incentives led to improvement, and providing spe uh, incentives specifically um, really got us to improvement. So um, that's my story. That's why I believe in PDSA. I thought it was a, a very powerful strategy. Uh, since then, we've seen all kinds of um, uh, work, more work-related situations um, improve fairly dramatically uh, by just being a little bit systematic about thinking what tests you're going to uh, test what you expect to learn from that test, and then taking the time to reflect on what you learned to inform your next test, uh, to not start out with a whole series of we got to do this and this and this, but to provide testing as you go along to see if, in fact, you're um, expending your efforts in the right direction. So thank you, Marisa. That's, that's all I have. All right. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, so we did get a question. Um, and the question that we got was, how important is buy-in from the sort of other subjects, I guess, in your in your plan, do, study, act cycle. Um, in this case, I guess it would have been your two kids and your husband. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. My husband just thought I was nuts and that our kids were headed for serious psychiatric therapy because I was following them around with stopwatches, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, that's peripheral. Um, you know, um, that is a great question, and um, honestly, the very best thing I did was to present this at our very first surgical infection prevention collaborative, and I seriously had five um, uh, quality um, 
managers from enormous hospitals or hospital systems come up to me later. I hadn't quite finished it. We hadn't done the um, very last test where I was thinking about conducting training on <laughs> how to put on the clothes you laid out. Um, and that was exactly the suggestion I got. Um, a, a very a delightful woman from one of our big hospital systems in Colorado, she said, you know, if you engaged your team a little better, um, you would probably get uh, better and faster results. And she said, give the stopwatch to the kids. Um, and I did, and she was absolutely right. Um, so really what I should have done is presented this to a bunch of uh, uh, female grandmother quality managers right from the get-go, and they probably would have told me that. But anyway, in the end, um, I did learn that was a critical component of what I should have done from the beginning. Okay, we got another question in from Ellen who asks, um, can you give um, – uh, can you talk a little bit more about what a balancing measure is? Uh, yes, a balancing measure is intended to um, elicit potential um, adverse consequences. Um, so I would say almost always the balancing measures that I value the most are measures of acceptability to the team making the change. So, uh, you know, if you decide, and especially this is, you're especially at risk of this if you have a large team and you have sort of a small core of that team making decisions about what to test. So it's easy to say, you know, out of our team of 10, let's just have, you know, let's just have Ellen do it all. Um, I mean, not that anybody intends to do that. Uh, so in the end, you need a balancing measure to make sure it's not causing damage in some place you didn't think about in the beginning. So by far the easiest balancing measure is um, acceptability to the people most directly affected um, of the test. Do you feel like it made your job easier or harder? Um, do you like this? Uh, keep in mind the real strength to PDSA is to try to leave it at almost the trial and error level um, so that you don't spend a lot of time collecting data. So on a day when you decide just to do things differently, we're going to enter this thing in this place, or we're going to, you know, whatever. Um, uh, you want to, at the end of the day, just basically check out with people. Um, you know, tell me, harder, easier, or the same. And so that's a great balancing measure. Um, there are much more sophisticated balancing measures, and I'd be happy to um, give response on specific questions if people have them. Okay, great. Thank you, Jane. And Ellen, if you have any, any further questions or you'd like more specific examples, feel free to um, send that in through chat or email us offline, and, and we can connect you um, with the resources that, that Jane mentioned. So with that, I think we, are, we are, uh, have gone through the questions that we had from chat. Um, so with that, I think we are going to turn things over to our team um, from, the, uh, uh, from Philadelphia to talk about how they put um, – uh, PDSA cycles into practice with their community-based care transition program. So I'm going to queue up the slides and then I'll introduce our speakers. So bear with me for one moment. Okay. Um, so first, let me introduce our two speakers from Philadelphia. Um, first, Stephen Tizell um, is a social worker with over 30 years of experience in a variety of clinical and administrative roles. He is currently the Director of Long-Term Care at the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, or PCA, which is the Area Agency on Aging for the City and County of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In this capacity, he oversees a broad range of state and federally funded long-term services and supports programs, which provide home and community-based services to over 15,000 older adults and people with disabilities on an annual basis. Um, teaming with Stephen Tizell will be Stephen Carson. Um, uh, Stephen Carson is a registered nurse with over 30 years of experience serving a variety of leadership roles in both clinical and administrative hospital operations. He holds a Master's of Science degree in Healthcare Administration from St. Joseph's University and a, Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor's of Science degree in Nursing from um, Gwynedd Mercy College. Um, he is currently the Vice President of Clinical Integration for Temple University Health System, and his primary areas of expertise include performance improvement, organizational change, home health and population management related to community case um, and disease management. So with that, I will turn things over to Stephen. Thank you, Marissa. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity to say a few words about the North Philadelphia Safety Net Initiative um, and then introduce my colleague Steve, uh, who will offer an illustration of how the partnership uh, made use of PDSA in the planning process. If you can move to the next slide. This uh, slide here is uh, basically the storyboard that we put together for a learning collaborative that we recently attended um, uh, regarding the Community Care Transitions Program. And uh, I'll sort of be walking through this a little bit, but uh, 
we'll leave this up for the entire time that I'm speaking, and uh, certainly you can read through some of the items on there uh, as well. Uh, the partnership, as you can see, includes uh, PCA, which is the Area Agency on Aging in the City of Philadelphia, and two safety net hospitals, Einstein Medical Center Philadelphia and Temple University um, Hospital. Um, the collaborative is one of, uh, or the partnership, I should say, is one of 30 nationally selected collaboratives uh, to provide community-based care transition services by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services under third Act, Section 3026 of the Affordable Care Act. Um, the goals of the Community Care Transition Program are to provide transitions of uh, beneficiaries from inpatient hospital setting to other care settings to improve quality of care, uh, to reduce readmissions of high-risk beneficiaries, and to document measurable savings to the Medicare program. The North Philadelphia Safety Net Partnership uh, selected the Illinois uh, Transitional Care Consortium's Bridge Model, which is an evidence-based social services model of community, case, community care transitions based on our root cause analysis, uh, on a root cause analysis which was conducted by both of the hospitals and PCA and identified a highly impoverished and medically underserved population. Uh, the intervention will follow Medicare fee-for-service patients who are being discharged at home from the hospital setting for a period of 30 days. The patients will be referred to the Community Care Transitions Program by a hospital-based navigator who will coordinate a number of pre-discharge activities, including medication reconciliation. PCA will then assign a bridge care coordinator who will assure patients follow up with their discharge plan including their primary and specialty care, pharmacy and home care needs through a variety of motivational interviewing and other patient activation strategies, either in person or by telephone. The level of patient's activation will be measured by the patient activation measure, PAM, both at uh, the onset of the intervention and at the end uh, of the 30-day period. Um, just but also by way of background, uh, this uh, collaborative uh, really came on the heels of uh, a number of years of working experience between the two hospitals and PCA. Uh, in addition to our role um, as the Area Agency on Aging, uh, one of the things that we did at both hospitals was to outstation assessment workers uh, for a period of time which worked directly with uh, the care management and social service teams at the hospitals and led to um, uh, referrals directly to the Area Agency on Aging uh, as well as to other community-based organizations. Uh, we've been working on this project for over a year now, um, and uh, it's been a planning process that's included the executive level staff of both of the hospitals, as well as PCA, planning staff and development staff, and actually culminated in the uh, application uh, that we submitted in response to CMS's solicitation. Um, as of today, actually, we are uh, uh, doing a trial run of our process, and some of the things that Steve will be talking about will include uh, some of the metrics that we've been uh, working on uh, over the past year or so uh, in putting this project together. So with that, I'd like to introduce Steve, who will uh, uh, walk through how we've made use of PDSA within our planning process. Thank you, Steve. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. Um, I, I want to just build off of a lot of great examples Jane gave. And Jane, I wish I would have done this when I was trying to get my daughter off to school and on time. So I, I definitely think and, and I can appreciate where you were in your process. Um, as we go through um, the PDSA cycle, I think it's really important to understand and emphasize really um, the planning and the testing component of it because I really think that that's where a lot of the true learning comes from as we uh, work through the process. Um, we will cover all the four uh, quadrants of the PDSA cycle in the work that we've done. And actually, this particular element that we'll be focused on are really part of the larger group that uh, Steve um, focused on as part of our uh, care transitions program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, from a data collection and communication standpoint, I think what's really what's really important when you fall under the planning section, it's really, you know, what define what your goal is. What are you really trying to accomplish in this process? And really for us, what we were trying to accomplish as part of the larger picture is to identify um, a methodology for data collection 
and, and we wanted to be able to do it with as minimal, minimal manual data collection because there's a large amount of outcomes data that we need to be able to submit. So we were always looking for a methodology to be able to create some electronic format in that process. And as I indicated, this particular initiative was a larger part of the overall execution of our uh, care transitions program. Next slide. So as we kind of went through this process, as Jane described uh, in her presentation, I think what really is important is you walk through and go through what the current state is. And for us, the current state really became our baseline for what we needed to accomplish in the implementation of the program. While we identified what the current state was, it was really all about uh, trying to determine what information systems were available to us, not only within Temple Hospital, but also with what information systems were available within um, the Philadelphia Corporation of the Aging and how we could get the two to interact, or do we need to identify a third-party system to, order, uh, to, to make that process um, more smooth for us. In addition to that, while we're looking at what those common systems were, we wanted to be able to understand what data elements were available. So when we're looking at demographic information, name, address, you know, um, admission information, admission diagnosis, um, date of transition, and I'm going to use that date of transition because I think it's really important for us is really the fact that the transition date many people will refer to as the discharge date. And for us, that transition date is really that movement into the, um, the bridge care, uh, care coordinator program overall. So it was really identifying what were the current systems and what were the current activities and what we were doing already today. And as Steve mentioned, we had a long-standing relationship before in the past in re with regards to having um, staff on site at each of our facilities. So it was how we, could we have, how could we do that job better? What change systems had changed over a period of time? And then really to flow that out overall as we move through the process. So we wanted to be able to understand how we could collect data and then um, also how to do it in that, as I indicated, um, automated fashion. Um, next is a uh, process map that we actually put together um, that helped us understand the current state, but also helped us identify what were those steps that we needed to go through. And I think there's a couple pieces within this process map that are really important. And that's really the flexibility of the process map, because if you notice, it's, this is a photograph of an existing process map. And even as is late of today, we've made adjustments to that process map and added some additional elements to it. It's a series of sticky notes that really actually are able to identify the individual steps of the process. Um, any decision points that need to occur, and then what, it, what is the flow in the process. So when we look at how new patients get enrolled, and then what happens when a previously admitted, enrolled patient is at our, um, in, within our emergency room or is going to be readmitted, you know, what are those steps in the communication, and then what are the data elements that we need to be able to collect in each one of those steps. So what this process map enables us to do is to be able to identify them, be able to easily change the steps because they are on post-it notes so you can move them around relatively quickly and be able to create that process that you want to pilot over a beginning uh, period of time. So this is this flow map is really a key tool in, a, in identifying the plan and then also as we make adjustments to our plan it's easily changed altogether and be and fairly flexible in that process. Uh, next slide please. So as we um, create our new current state, really what we're taking the opportunity to do is be able to identify all the different steps in the process. So what we came up with as we went through the planning process was really just to look at how we did our referrals. We identified a unique um, individual uh, information system that we could share between all three facilities. And then we looked at what the documentation process needed to be from the navigators at each of the hospitals, as well as what the information that the bridge care coordinator was also going to document. So we identified our metrics. Um, we, those metrics included outcome measures, readmissions, um, return to physician offices post-discharge, uh, in, including um, activation scores, so based on a, a survey tool that we'll be utilizing, what are those scores that will help us understand how that um, patient changes uh, within the care treatment process, patient satisfaction, 
and um, just the transition services overall. So what type of services that we're going to put in place and how they'll work and, um, and the coordination of that over a period of time. Uh, we confirmed the fields that we needed to put into the data entry process and also confirmed that referral process. And last but not least, we also wanted to incorporate some test reporting formats so we can understand, based on the data that we enter into the system, what are those test formats as we continue. So from the next step perspective, what you really see in this process is really the different screens that we're showing you are moving forward to the different tools that we're utilizing. So for, for, this, so for this particular slide, it's really how we've created the referral. So these are the referral information that we're actually sending off to PCA, which includes names, social security, phone numbers, all those different elements that we identified that we needed to report on in the process. And then at the end, this particular referral that's entered in at the hospital level will actually go to the local level down in the Philadelphia Corporation of the Aging, so they'll be able to um, see the referral and be able to react to the, the, the process and have the bridge care coordinator come into the facility. Then the next slide is really what PCA will be, has begun to build within their, um, within to their computer systems. So you'll see the 1 through 20, these are all the different levels of metrics that we've identified in this process to be able to make sure that we note them and be able to create outcome measures around. Next slide, please. So today, as um, Steve mentioned early in the process, we are really in the do phase of this process. So really the do is about performing the test and identifying problems within um, the process and then also document those observations in between. So actually today we started our pilot program. So based on that flow map that we showed earlier, we're actually beginning to enroll patients into the program. So from a pilot perspective, we identified a specific diagnosis within our, our work group to be able to, to move that patient through each of the steps so we could understand does the process work well? Um, are the tools appropriate? Um, do we need to make changes in our consent forms, our script, um, and actual the um, data that we enter into the system and then begin to run some reports around um, the data that we put in all together so we can understand what that process is. This particular pilot is going to run for a two-week period of time, but we meet on a regular basis because what our goal is is to keep that process map in place, and we will continue to refine and change each one of them as we identify issues, problems, and concerns. And we want to be able to do this during a, a very short window of time so we can be able to begin to make changes and do our final implementation product. Next, please. So that leads us really to the study component of it. So when we, when we work through our process overall from the study, it's really summarizing what the, our lessons learned are. So as we go through it, um, our lesson, we will be focused on several key areas. It will be focused on the electronic um, referral system. Did the system work as it was intended? If not, what do we need to change? What processes we need to add? And how do we need to revise it? From a communication perspective, we want to make sure that the electronic notifications worked as intended. Built into the process are automatic emails and communication to the uh, bridge care coordinators and to the PCA to identify members. We want to make sure all those email uh, correspondences work. Um, did the messaging process provide a value-added component? So if we sent the email out to the bridge care co coordinator, is it something that really made a difference on how they did their work or was it was an unnecessary uh, component in their work and it was a step that we need to eliminate? From a documentation perspective, you know, do the tools meet the documentation requirements that we were looking for from a bridge care coordination perspective? So does it does the information require duplicative um, entry into the PCA system? Is it the right information going back into PCA that they need to be able to create their treatment plans, to be able to come in uh, to uh, speak with the patients? Is there sufficient information for follow-up? So do we have enough phone numbers and backup addresses and contact individuals to make sure that that process is in place? And then um, what additional education is needed from our perspective, who else needs to be involved in the communication about the program? Some of the early things that we've identified through our process is, you know, 
there are elements of um, departments, both internal to our organization as well as external audiences that we need to train and communicate to. So for example, what is the role of the bridge care coordinator with the home care agency? So we have our home care agencies going to come in and have an um, in-service education. What is the role of the bridge care coordinator as they work with our physician practices? And we have a large number of FQHCs that are in our community. So how do we work with the um, FQHCs that actually have wraparound services? So as we go through our, our study part of this um, process, we will identify, A, that the process works extraordinarily well, or we'll make minor modifications to the process and then build on our education plan that we need to be able to do in the process. So in the end, on the ACT perspective of it, is really determining um, how we want to hardwire our process overall. So we've, we, in, when we're finished, we will make final modifications of the flow. We will, we will uh, memorialize the final process. So when we're finished, we will know each step, each communication point, each decision point in the process that will be able to create a smooth uh, transition of the patient, as well as understanding the data that we that is necessary for the reporting um, cycle that we need to complete. And then, um, if we need to, we will redesign and retest the process. Our, our goal for our particular um, initiative is really to move forward um, and have a final deadline for implementation by June 1st. So that's our target date. So we believe that these small little cycles of um, PDSA as we move through it will actually help us define the process and make it a very secure process when we open up beyond the test patient population and um, implement our fuller program with our Medicare fee-for-service patients starting in June. With that, I'll take questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, before, let me uh, we tr see what questions have come in. Uh, let me go back. There we go. And talk a little bit about, as we always do, we wrap up with just talking about some resources um, that we found to be helpful in, in putting this together um, as we were thinking about the concept as well as um, talk a little bit about our next training. Um, first, uh, just a resource, uh, you, you heard Jane mention um, the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, and, and how they have worked on, on uh, PDSA cycles and done some training on this. Uh, we included a link to their site, uh, which is their How to Improve site, um, so you can learn more about PDSA cycles. Um, in addition, as always, we've included some resources on, on care transitions, um, since that's been a large part of our focus of, of this webinar series over the course of the past uh, year plus now. Um, and finally, some, some resources on the Affordable Care Act. Um, for those of you who, are, who may be frantically scribbling down links, um, we will be posting the recording slides and transcript of this uh, webinar uh, on the AOA website. Again, you can click on the Health Reform and the Aging Network button on our homepage, which is www.aoa.gov. And again, click on the Health Reform and the Aging Network uh, button on that page, and that will bring you to our ACA page, which uh, lists our webinars. So our next training, um, we will continue our training series in May. It'll likely be late May, probably before uh, Memorial Day. Um, we we are still working out. We have a couple of ideas in terms of topics. Um, we're still uh, so the date and topic are are to be determined. Uh, but please do watch your email. Um, it will come out in one of our AOA e news, which comes out on Mondays. You can sign up for those as well on the AOA website, uh, which is again www.aoa.gov, um, and uh, we'll send out that registration information in early May. Um, so with that, uh, uh, one last thing. First, um, if you have any questions, uh, if you think of any questions, we're going to open things up for questions in a moment. Um, but if you have any additional questions um, that you think of after we've concluded our webinar, or if you have comments, um, stories about how your organization has implemented PDSA cycles, or suggestions for future webinar topics, uh, we do welcome those. And you can send those to affordablecareact at aoa.hhs.gov. Um, with that, Pat, if you could give people uh, instructions as to how they can queue up on the audio line. Certainly. Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask a question on the phone lines, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Please unmute your phone and record your name when prompted. To withdraw your question, press star 2. 
Again, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone to ask a question, remembering to unmute your phone and record your name. One moment, please. All right, while we're, while we're waiting for people to queue up if they have questions, um, we did get a question in from Ellen who asks um, for, for um, Steve and Stephen, um, have you seen any major differences between dealing with long-term care institutions to which um, patients are discharged from your hospital versus going home? And, and, and I should mention you all are just in the beginning stages of starting your work, so I'm not sure you necessarily have um, anything to comment on, but please do feel free um, to do so if you have experience, which you can use to answer this question. This is Steve Carson. Um, I'm going to an answer the question in a, in a different way. I think what's important that we've been able to create in this process is really our relationship between the Philadelphia Corporation and the aging and our the acute care hospitals that are part of this um, initiative. I think the partnership and our ability to be able to open the lines of communication among one another and to be able to create um, a system that will assist in that transition process is going to be much different than some of the work that we've done before in the past. Um, some of the work before in the past has been, you know, Philadelphia Corporation has been a service that's been out there in the community, and this is really about creating the re a different kind of relationship and creating more of a partnership than a vendor-hospital perspective. So I would suspect as we continue to move forward, it's that partnership that's going to improve our ability to um, uh, transition care. Okay, so terrific. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Pat, have we gotten anyone on the audio line? No, ma'am. I'm showing no questions at this time. All right. We'll give everyone um, one more moment, and I'll just remind um, folks that, again, if you have questions, you can put them into chat or certainly queue up in the audio line. Um, and if not, we will um, uh, close things out. Um, Pat, any anyone queue up at this point? No, I'm not showing any. Okay. Um, with that, I want to then thank say thank you to our speakers, to Jane, um, Steve, and Stephen uh, for for wonderful thought provoking a thought for broking presentations, um, and thank all of you for being on the line today and on the web with us. Um, and again, if you think of any additional questions or if you have suggestions for future webinar topics, um, we invite you to email us at affordablecareact at aoa.hhs.gov. Um, we do want these webinars to be as useful to you as possible, so we welcome your suggestions. Um, last call, uh, Pat, any, anyone queue up? No, ma'am, I'm not showing any questions at this time. Okay. Well, then with that, we will say thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to having you with us on future webinars. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, you. thank you. Thank you for your participation on today's conference call. You may disconnect at this time.